few examples, of, you know, going into the future, like and, and some of the drivers. And the drivers come from lots of different sectors. So first of all, just thinking about science, like the science, um, the genetic sequencing, DNA being extracted from bones of um, animals. You know, we we actually on the brink of a lot of scientists trying to identify the first species that they'll bring back to life. You know, like this is actually. In, in the shorter term, and then it's sort of like, okay, well, in 50 to 100 years, species resurrection um, may be the norm in our science. And then you go, okay, well, what does that actually also mean for our biodiversity management? Because people might go, well, we don't have to worry about it anymore because we've got the, the human solution to that. Um, so anyway, I just, I just sort of thought that was really interesting. There's a great article in the um, Canberra Times um, about it on the weekend, I don't know if anyone read it, but it's just like, wow, this is much closer than I ever expected. Um, health is a sector where it really taps into a lot of the values we talked about earlier. And, you know, everyone's got their new watches now and um, going out, um, tracking, um, what's it called, the um, Strava, you can get your data about where you've been, how much energy you've used, da da da. And I was thinking, well, it, it's actually highly valued, but the market's not capturing it at the moment. So what markets could be created with all this new technology and all this new data? And the health industry is one where they can really provide lots and lots of incentives. So people are now paying less for insurance if they can prove that they're going out into nature. And nature's important because it's physical and mental health. So you might end up with huge new environmental markets and even private parks being established to tap into these new markets. Um, on land use, um, look, <laughs> it's um, we can have a whole new system for agriculture. Agriculture is more than half our land use. Um, we talk a lot, in Canberra is the issue, but it, it really is a thin sliver of our um, know, current land use across Australia. Um, and we can have, just like we've got trade water rights, trade eco rights, um, whole new markets again for ecosystem farming. Uh, the profitability in agriculture in a lot of areas is very, very low. And with climate change, maybe there's whole new areas of establishing these ecosystems. Um, uh, we just talked a lot about values today, but this is just a, um, you know, the whole range. We've got um, global greenies. People are terrified of the action. Um, and then other people are just like, let's not worry, let's party. Um, but then there's this, I think a real thing is that there's also people who just go, look, that's not as important as a lot of other issues. So I don't know how we can deal with that. Um, one other thing just to think about is um, within the ACT, are we going to have governance where really the boundaries are quite blurred and we are managing our environment in terms of the biophysical and the social context and not the sort of jurisdictional boundary? Or are we going to go to Fortress OCT and we we sort of got so annoyed with New South Wales that we're saying we're gonna educate our own, do our own health, and really you're you're not there. And just the last one was really that there's so many drivers and we've got a spectrum of many possible futures. The uncertainty is the only certain thing, so we've got a plan, plan, plan for lots of talking about the parameters facing canvas development. The um, population now is about 390,000. Since 2004, it's grown by about 60,000. And there's projections that have been made by the Chief Minister's Department a couple of years ago, which indicates that the population will uh, grow to 615,300 by 2051, which sounds fairly precise. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, one of the things about population projections is they're very, uh, when they're made, the assumptions seem to be reasonable, but I, I remember the 2003 projections that were made when uh, Canberra's population then was set to uh, reach 390,000 and then decline. So I think these are a useful, a useful tool in uh, looking at the future, but there's always a word of caution about what the assumptions are behind it. Uh, one of the major assumptions in this projection is that net overseas migration to Canberra will be about 2,800 people a year, and that was kind of done when Canberra gets about 1% of, of Australia's national net overseas migration. And then, uh, about five years ago, net overseas migration to Canberra, which three, uh, Australia, it's 300,000. 
now it's dropped to 200,000. So the projections are tracking a little bit lower than what they were saying. But one of the associated with this population growth is also going to be an ageing of the population. The uh, population over 65 is um, projected to grow from 11% to, to 20% by 2051, so that's a major change. Um, one of the other things is that when you have that type of level of population growth, you then need to uh, convert it to demand for uh, housing and other urban facilities. And dwelling occupancy rates declined from about 3.6 in 1970 to about 2.4 today. So there's likely that they'll decline even further. So if you're trying to cope for uh, that level of population growth, there's about 160,000 dwellings in Canberra today. Uh, you'll probably need 105 to 110,000 dwellings to cater for that level of population. And so then it gets choices. The government has a 50-50 policy about greenfields development and development in established areas. Uh, if you use that as a guide, and I think at the current time it's a pretty good guide, you'll uh, need to start looking at possible new greenfields areas in the ACT. The expect expectation is that Gungahl and Bands of Power run out in 2028. So then a whole range of engineering and uh, ecological studies will have to be done to explore where we should go after that if, if we go up uh, and do develop another greenfields area. So it's all those sort of things and areas like Carlin Forest and uh, West Murray dare I say, uh, <laughs> Boulder Creek, uh, Central Malongo, there's a whole range of possibilities. And obviously the Sirau land in uh, next to the Barton Highway is being investigated and I think they're talking about around 7,000 dwellings and 16,500 population. So that's something that will be investigated over the next few years as well. <coughs> Obviously there will be implications for infrastructure uh, across the city. So all these things um, um, we need to look at future housing choices. About 77% of uh, Canberrans live in separate houses uh, today in 2011. Uh, dwelling commencements over the last 10 to 15 years, there's been about 60% of them apartments and, or 55% of them apartments and townhouses. So there is a dwelling shift going on, but just because um, people, uh, households are becoming smaller, there's issues about will they all desire a small dwelling and will they all want to live by a tram line going down North Point Avenue? So there's, um, or, or in the town centres. So uh, there's a whole range of issues about housing choice that need to be explored. One of the things that's been scheduled is that the executive has to consider a review of the, uh, the planning strategy of the ACT in 2017. So these sort of issues I should be canvassed uh, in that review. And so obviously the ecological values of the various areas that could be considered. And you know, one option would be to have no greenfields land in the ACT, extra greenfields land in the ACT. But then we've got the issues if it's in New South Wales, you might have high transport costs and uh, high travel uh, to access facilities in Canberra. So these are some of the, the main issues that I, I see over the next few years is that Canberra's going to be growing. Uh, uh, the level of growth might be a little bit uncertain, but sometime in the future there'll need to be considerations of where Canberra's greenfields demand to grow. Because I don't think there'll be any real possibility of um, it being all absorbed within the established areas of Canberra. Thanks, Mike. Just a point of so clarification. So let's talk about um, drivers for change in biodiversity. And it, it, it's easy to think of that in really biophysical terms. We're going to have changes in temperature, changes in rainfall. Um, and we know that a lot of the models that have been done suggest that, for example, our woodlands are likely to become either a lot shrubbier or a lot grassier. And, and we're not sure which one, right? <laughs> um, but if we take the grassy one for an example, the rubber really hits the road for biodiversity when you take that sort of simple interpretation of drivers and their consequences and then integrate it with things like population growth and the other constraints that we uh, also have sort of no control over. So if we have much grassier woodlands, one of the key implications of that is much greater fire risk. More fires, higher intensity fires. If we have lots of urban development, then what we have is more of a, of a black and whiting of the landscape. We have really urbanized areas next to nature reserves that are really grassy, that are full of fire risk. Great. What do we do about this? Well, one option, of course,
years, and this is something emergency services type people are already talking about, is we do a whole lot less asset protection, you know, burning. We let things be grassy, we let there be fires. But then, people have to spend a lot more money constructing houses that are more fireproof, um, or they have to spend a lot more money on insurance when they live next to reserves. So it's potentially a very costly solution, but one that allows the ecosystems to change as we think they will and, and have natural fire regimes. So we could have that, the expensive building solution. But that's probably not something that's going to sit real well with general community values, notwithstanding Heather's forecasting that a, that a few of those might change. Um, so what else might we consider doing to keep those fuel loads down? Well, let's see, we could do a whole, whole, whole lot of controlled burning. That won't help biodiversity. It'll be really expensive and time consuming. What are the other things that kind of control fuel loads? I know, grazing. We've all got, we've got tons of problems with trying to manage our kangaroos. How about if we just stop and we let kangaroos and rabbits just absolutely take over? So, another possible future is where you just, we just let the kangaroos and the rabbits go. They graze the place to buggery. We don't have the fire risk and everyone can live next to a nature reserve that probably still has a lot of recreation value, even though it might lack some of that mystery and maybe some of the services. But maybe that's not quite the way we want to go um, because, of, because of the values that we would lose as a result. Maybe there are technological solutions on the horizon. You know, with the rise of computers, as Dorto was talking about this morning, how fast that's been, you know, maybe by the time we're looking at 2065, 2070, maybe we'll just have some robots. And the robots can <laughs> roll in the nature reserve just slashing things in a very targeted way so that we can reduce fire risk at key times of year but, but still let a native species maybe set seed, flower and set seed. Um, but we don't, we don't know whether this is a possible future. Um, but, but what um, we're trying to illustrate is just like Heather was pushing you to think about these really different sorts of futures. That's what I'm trying to do here as well. Um, totally outside the realm of the things we normally talk about at the moment. At the moment, we make management decisions that are about, you know, okay, what time of year should we do this controlled burn? Um, you know, how many controlled burns should we do here? Not, should we abandon controlled burning altogether and let the rabbits and the kangaroos take over? But these are the sorts of big decisions, radical decisions, that may be facing us in the future. Maybe not today, but if we don't prepare for them, they will get made without biodiversity as part of the consideration. They will get made because of the expense of doing this sort of thing. So the purpose here today is to, to take this kind of radical thinking that I don't know, I sort of tend to just do in the shower, <laughs> see if we can draw it out of everyone in this room and do so in a way that's useful for ensuring that we're actually preparing for some of these really strange and radical decisions in the future. Wonderful. Veronica, Jesus, you've set the bar high there with the props. <laughs> I'll have a couple of that on camera. I think you might be your audition. My question from my table, which doesn't come from the table, comes from me. <laughs> 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 
because we'll cut off before it was suggested. Uh, what would happen if we increase the actual area of the ACT, say, um, you know, threefold or fivefold to actually include, you know, yes, Queenby and some of the outlying areas? So um, there's a lot of collaboration around the capital region, which is largely that, and we're working um, with like, five or six local governments in this class at the moment to try and get that, how much, how close they can work together. Um, look, we could go into a future that really cements that and, you know, planning decisions, for instance, actually strategically plan around the capital region rather than the ACT. We know we need that, but that's where we go. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, there's even been talk about changing the ACT border, but constitutionally or whatever, you need agreement from this, it's impossible. So I think it will be other mechanisms. Um, but, you know, who knows, we're going to come under pressure that we, the politicians don't get on and they're competing and, you know, it might be like, look, we're sick of it. You know, we're always picking up New South Wales health medical bills and we just, we just want to, we'll be better off being a fortress ACT, so... Okay, so one option is planning based on greater focus on the capital region. Mm -hmm. This idea around fortress ACT is a, is a really interesting one. Tim, over to you next. It's just interesting that like both of these and ours is about the sort of competition between sort of, I guess, climate change drivers and impact on ecology and development. And it's just a derivation. It's about, you know, how do we continue to balance these competing drivers of development and impacts of climate change on ecology into the future when we know that we are going to have higher and higher resources having to go into supporting an ageing population into the health sector and also the education sector of course. So Veronica, how do we strike the balance? So I think it relates very much to the values discussion. It's about tapping into what, what at its most core is really important about biodiversity in the ACT. So that rather than trying to sink money and effort into keeping it the same, keeping it pristine, having every species there, um, that we're a bit more kind of rational about it and, and, and find a way to balance the resources so that we're still managing biodiversity in a way that it delivers the core values, but maybe not in a way that it looks and feels exactly the way it does today. Okay, so more rational thinking and planning approaches. Tira, up the back there. Okay, so so one question that might emerge from this table is um, the role of technology in scenarios thinking. So it is plausible to imagine futures where we have a wonderful technical solutions such as the robotic slashers and so on and so forth. But the question is, uh, is it better for futures thinking to not assume these kind of technical fixes? Uh, although there, you can think of them as possible, perhaps it is uh, too much of a technical fix and we are better off uh, using our futures thinking time to not include those kind of contacts. So, do we, or do we not allow for technical, technological fixes? Just a quick comment. I think it should include technological advances. Maybe you don't sort of say you know, flying cars or whatever or, or specific things, but technology in terms of things like information, you know, it's communication, data is going to be, you know, really continue to jump. Um, and I think, you know, we can see the next 10 years, but actually going right into the future, it would just be amazing. And so I think it's hard to imagine that. Yeah, I mean, what I was going to say is, as you'll see through the day, and as Tira is well aware of, you don't plan for any one future to be the one. So the potential for technological fixes should be in the mix. But it's about shifting our decision making to be less deterministic, to be thinking that there are a range of possibilities um, and we need decision making processes that can still guide us in the right directions given that full suite of possibilities. Wonderful. Thanks, so basically continue to include them in the mix perhaps put a little bit of a boundary on things that might be a little bit out, outlandish, flying cars and like. Um, down the back. Yep, so on our table there was discussion on the more intense development with the more concentrated housing, so the up not out, and then what options you see for meeting that sort of range of, of values. So 
uh, yeah, where you would have more opportunities. Um, Particularly the, the recreational and the... So one of the things about going up and not out is that you've got to have uh, households want to actually live in the, the high density dwellings. And uh, currently there's very little uh, demand for high density dwellings with families with, with children. There's very few, uh, I think it's less than 7 or 8 percent of all 14 year olds live in apartments and, and townhouses even. So you've really got to uh, look at, um, if you want to go up, you've got to start looking at uh, the design of those uh, high density dwellings so that they are more attractive. You've also got issues about affordability. Uh, more intense development tends to uh, lead to higher land values, so you've got trade offs to be made between affordability and housing. Housing choices, so it's it's no simple issue just to assume that um, you can have high density dwellings and you can forget about the fringe development. And in the ACT, if you did that, then the market just shift over the board for people who want to attach dwelling, and then you've got high transport costs, accessing and other things in the ACT. It's interesting, Mike. Decisions about what's the housing that occurs here in the ACT can affect what people's behaviour might be in terms of property elsewhere in Queanbeyan. Well, at the moment, apartment dwellings are basically designed for an mm -hmm. investor market. So they don't really build for people with children or other meeting the needs of people actually living, living in them. So you've got to start addressing those sort of issues as well, just trying to make the, the market respond to the preferences of the population. Wonderful. Thanks, Mike. And to round things out, we're going to go Russell over to you. Okay, so, so the, the comment was made that the asset government depends a lot on a lot of its income. Um, from land leases. Um, so I suppose that the question to me that seems relevant to that is, is, is that a, a trend that's likely to continue and is it likely to affect the, the rate at which we go for the rings with the rights or the rings? Well, uh, I think the experience over the last 10 years has been that the uh, land development agency in particular places a lot of uh, emphasis on, and Treasury places a lot of emphasis on land revenue. And I don't think they take a holistic view of the actual costs involved in developing the city. So they might say that um, you get more land revenues from developing on the bridge because it's going to build land. But if they took in the holistic account of the transport costs of accessing various aspects of the city, you'd have a more balanced assessment of what the true cost of, of development were. But if we're going to fund this for fucking uh, redevelopments and light rail and those sort of things, the money has to come from somewhere. So, and there is expectation that there will be some land increases in land values along the light rail routes, and so you may be able to fund some of it by that. But Treasury, I think, would be a little bit disappointed. But in some ways, land has been our, our minerals. Uh, we keep slogging it off to, and once it's gone, uh, then what are we going to do is keep the, the system being funded in the future. Wonderful. Sorry, I just want to a quick comment coming back to about Kappa region. You know, the fact that New South Wales can make money from their own land release and these other market incentives to keep the expansion outside of Canberra is part of the reason we can't get strategic planning going for a capital venture. Wonderful. Well, can you join me in thanking our panellists?